everybody, and welcome to Fleet Nav Systems Tuesday live stream. Today I have got Trooper Hoover on the line so that you guys can ask him any questions that you have about hours of service or ELDs or whatever you happen to have for us today. It looks like Christina Jones was first today. Thanks for being here, Christina. Thanks guys for putting up with that brief technical glitch that we had. Uh, Trooper Hoover, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you for having me back. Sure, thanks for being here. We uh, had a lot of requests to have you back. So, and everybody, if you, the uh, audio is too loud or anything on either end, just put that into the chat as well. Um, so, Trooper Hoover, before we get started, I just wanted to let everybody else in the chat know that uh, you guys, while you're watching this live, if you have any questions for us um, about any hours of service stuff, please put them into the chat. That's what it's there for. I'm happy to ask Trooper Hoover any of these questions that you've got. And uh, so in the meantime, while we're waiting for some other questions, I am going to pull up uh, one of the topics that has been on everyone's mind lately. I imagine you've heard quite a bit about it there, Trooper Hoover. The, uh, the new hours of service regulations. What do you think about those? Well, um, you, you are correct, and I believe it was May uh, they basically introduced the verbiage and said after so many days they'll go into play, and I believe that's September 29th, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't have it right here, but basically September's when it's coming. Um, I personally think it was it's a step in the right direction. Um, I've, I've spoke with drivers and enforcement and everything and i i think it is a step in the right direction i know some drivers are like well this or that but hey it, it, it's a step in step in the direction so if we can work on these make these work it, it, it's just going to keep things moving moving in that right direction um but yeah um there was four four major changes um that'll be coming up um, first one being the short haul exemption. Um, it's going to stretch basically the previous short haul was if you stay within 100 air miles of the home terminal, return to the home terminal within 12 hours, um, you would basically not have to utilize a logbook. Um, one of the big changes there is going to be they're going to stretch that to a 14-hour workday, of course, max 11-hour drive time and then 150 air miles. So that 150 is real common for non-CDL vehicles and also ag exempt commodities and stuff get the 150. But now we're gonna see that big change from 100 air miles to 150 for the CDL vehicles. And then the 12 hour workday is gonna stretch to the 14 with the max of course of 11 hours drive time. So, so that's going to be a big change. I see a lot of uh, that benefit, a bit of fitting a lot of the local companies. I know, especially in my area of the state, we have those companies that was just over the limit, 110, 120 air miles. So this getting it stretched to 150 is definitely going to really help out. Um, the next change was also adverse driving. Basically, they've they uh, added that. Um, before you could stretch your, basically, you could stretch it two hours, but what it's going to do is allow that 14-hour clock to be stretched by two hours and your 11 to be stretched by two hours. And the thing is, you really need to pay particular attention to the adverse driving. That's weather conditions, road conditions, stuff that was not known prior to being dispatched. So don't get don't get caught up on that and just list something as adverse. And then if you're stopped roadside, not not being able to, to basically define and explain what that was. So be real careful there. Um, the next big change is the 30-minute break. Um, previously, the 30-minute break had to be taken after coming on duty. Basically, you couldn't do any driving after the eight hours of coming on duty, and it had to be satisfied with a 30-minute off-duty or sleeper berth. Well, the change to that is now it's just a total, total of eight hours drive time. Before it was 
any on-duty driving added up to eight. Now it's just a period of eight hours drive time. And then the 30-minute break, instead of being satisfied by off-duty or sleep or birth only, can now be satisfied with a 30-minute on-duty break. So um, you're driving along, you decide, you know what, I'm going to hop off here, um, fuel the truck, um, check the load, you know, do something like that for 30 minutes, still on duty, that's going to count. So that's that's a big uh, a big change there is on that. And then, of course, the final thing, and I'm just kind of summarizing all these, if you guys want to know more information, definitely the FMCSA website is just a wealth of knowledge. Go there, type in new hours of service, and you can verbatim see that. they got plenty of cheat sheets flow charts, all sorts of stuff to make it easy to understand. But the next big thing was the hours of service when it came to sleeper birth and breaking up your sleeper birth. Previously, in a nutshell, and we could sit here for the next three hours and talk about scenarios, but basically in a nutshell, um, when you use split sleeper, it had to be eight hours to pause your 14 in the sleeper and then coupled with a two-hour break. Now they're basically going to say it can be a seven-hour paired with the three hour or a combination thereof so um and then what's also going to benefit the driver is that two or that three hours if con- coupled together with that break time is going to pause your 14 as well it's not going to count against it and that's something new so um so yeah that in a quick nutshell is the re- the basically the new hours of service that we'll be looking forward to come the end of September. That's great. Thank you for that. I've got a couple of questions about that, and then we'll take some from the chat. Uh, and if anybody yep. here watching this is uh, is a, a Geotab user, just know that Geotab is already working on implementing these changes, and you're not going to have to do, you shouldn't have to do anything. Follow us. If anything does come up, I'll let you know, but you shouldn't have to do anything from your ELD side of things. That's something that it should be an automatic system update and all you, you should see all the changes come through. So uh, the short haul exemption, the fact that it got uh, changed to the 150 air miles and that 14 hour work shift, um, that does sound a lot like all of these other ones that were out there. Was Do you know offhand, like was that something that, are they just trying to kind of standardize things or just make it a little easier? Do you know any of the stuff behind that one behind which one i'm sorry that's okay the short haul exemption the fact that they made that um kind of more in line with some of those other driving durations and uh and radiuses and things radii well i think um and this is again um this is just my personal opinion this is not the fmcsa sure i'm gonna I'll splash up our not legal advice thing on here, so you're good now. (laughs) Yeah, and and like I said, this is just my opinion. This is just things that that I have seen. So, hold on. Yeah, Yeah, sure. No problem. Just a moment, everybody. We'll be right back a second and the kids and i got one that doesn't like dark clouds and thunderstorms so she had to get a weather so, no, no but problem. no um and, and this is one of those things i think what they did was they had non-cdls they had ag exemptions getting all these 150 air mile radiuses and i think they just kind of looked at the data and was like you know what we can tie in these other classifications of carriers and give them the same benefits so um and I, I see a lot, like I said, a lot of local uh, people are, are kind of excited about this one because it's going to free up a lot of heartache. It's going to free up a lot of, well, do I need to run a log? Do I need to run an ELD today? What, what is, exactly am I doing today? Sure. Yep, that's great. Um, and then the, I guess what I hadn't realized on that 30-minute break one was that it's eight hours of driving time not just that on duty and drive time. So that should make quite a big difference too. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's one of the big changes there was before, if you came on duty at say uh, 6 a.m., 
and then you went to your motor carrier and you sat and waited to be loaded for two hours and then you drove um, two hours. You know, there's four hours already towards this, but now at that point, um, um, and like I said, so then now it's only going to tabulate and get like um, the first two hours. Yeah. So like now that any time you're stopped loading or doing anything on duty, it's not going to count. So um, there are some folks that they do many, so many dropping hooks or stopping that, you know, in a 14 hour day, they may not even drive 11 or eight total hours. Sure. But, but, but then again, it's going to add up too. So two hours here, four hours there, there's six, another two hours. Now it's eight hours. But that on duty time, is going to count towards your 30 minute break. So really, if you're breaking it up and you don't have any blocks of eight hours, you may not need to technically take a 30 minute break. So now, instead of only having that 13 and a half hour, now you got your full 14 hours yeah. of working you can play do. Okay, yep, that makes a lot of sense too. Um, going back to the second point about that adverse driving conditions when um, now, there were, now from what I understand, there already was an adverse driving conditions exemption. Is that true? That is correct. That is correct. And what it did was, say, um, say I left Terre Haute, Indiana, mm -hmm. and I was driving to um, Holland, Michigan. Um, and, and let's just say, and if, I'm sure somebody will be out there and go, oh, well, that, Technically, that's nine and a half hours. But let's just say, um, let's just say, I look at my map and I go, you know what? I can do that in a ten and a half hours of drive time, which means I'm under on my eleven and I'm under on my fourteen. Well, say I get up into Michigan, and all of a sudden there's one of those freak whiteout conditions, and it takes me an extra, you know, two hours. Well, before I could stretch my two hours if I had the time. And that was if you had the time, you could stretch it, um, but you could not exceed your 14. Well, now what it's saying is you could stretch your 11 and you can stretch your 14 within that, that time frame. Now, that doesn't mean that if, say, the road stoppage was only 30 minutes, it doesn't mean you get an extra hour and a half to advance. It just means that basically if you could have, completed that in your two hour time or you need to find somewhere safe to park you've got that a lot of time worked in so just and then again it's got to be something that um wasn't known to your dispatch wasn't known to you like i said a a freak uh, a freak wide out um sure. like in my area today where we're under uh potential for some uh thunder showers well yeah, it could be thunder showers, but we all know Midwest, late summer, all of a sudden a uh, rainstorm could pop up and roads are flooded for a half hour, 45 minutes that nobody knew was going to happen. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Or worse, a bad traffic crash. You got, And the best thing to do is if you're going to utilize this exemption is document, document, document. One, because if you get stopped within a week later it's going to show on your logs and if you've got a big block of time with no justification that's going to look really bad and be really hard to explain but if you've got a traffic crash i-80 such and such mile marker you know that's information that we could research or if the company's ever audited that type of information is going to be easily easily researched and verified so so make it easy on yourself. Make it easy on, or on that inspector. When I when I do a lot of outreach, I try to tell drivers, you know, you want to make it as easy on the inspector as possible because when we come walking up to the truck and it's a clean, quick, easy inspection, the happier we are, the happier you're going to be. You know, if we're standing there going through three years' worth of registrations, coffee stained, you know, <laughs> you're digging annual inspections out of the – you know, back of the bunk and, and can't produce the proper paperwork, it's going to go downhill rather quickly. So take a few minutes, document that time, and 
especially, you know, if you're stopped in traffic, what else are you doing? Get on sure. your device, annotate, document it, and that, you know, that'll help you out in that long run. What, what would you say the percentage of, uh, like, violations and things could be avoided if people just annotated properly? Um, when it comes to logbooks um, and with everything, I, I – I wouldn't know the national, but just me personally, just sure, just in the re- with with the recent guess, I would say at least you know a third to a half of the violations are just general form and manner, which includes not annotating, not doing this, um, and, and especially when you talk of, and we could talk for the next six hours on personal conveyance, but personal conveyance is another big one. You need to document what you're doing and what you're using that for. And if you've got any questions on personal conveyance, and I suggest this to every every driver, is go to the FMCSA website, type in personal conveyance. They have an awesome section, and it talks, it basically defines personal conveyance, and then what it does, it gives you examples of acceptable personal conveyance, and then it gives you examples of not acceptable personal conveyance. Because the better you track that you're really going to avoid issues of false logs stuff like that where annotating can't help you you know so so definitely take that time um type in those notes it's really really going to help you in the long run that's great thank you uh christina jones has a question for us in the chat she asks what's the law about cdl and farming in indiana and that's all the context I have, so I don't know if you need any clarification or if that's good for you there. Well, usually when when you get a roadside inspector in Indiana and they, they stop a farmer, it's usually, ugh, <laughs> <laughs> just because all the exemptions. So basically what it is, um, if I, Brent Hoover, own Brent Hoover Farms and I farm 500 acres mm-hmm. and I own – brand new Peterbilt and a brand new Wilson hopper bottom if it's all registered and I'm using it on the farm hauling my own product quote unquote own product mm-hmm. I do not need a CDL to do that now if I Brent Hoover the farmer hire Billy Bob to come and be a farmhand on my farm and he's hauling my grain mm-hmm. he's also exempt from CDL but if I, Brent Hoover, with my brand new Peterbilt truck and, and the hopper bottom, you call me up as a neighbor and say, hey, my uh, my truck broke down. Can you come over here and haul my grain for me, and I'll, I'll refund you some money for fuel and stuff? And if I say, sure, well, now I'm outside the scope of that exemption. Now whoever's operating my truck's going to need CDLs, portion plates. They're going to need the whole gamut. So. Um, the big thing is, when it comes to Indiana, you've got to haul your own product with your own equipment. So you you start stepping outside of that line, that's where it gets real gray area and and gets to be a big a big headache. So hopefully that kind of that's kind of in a nutshell everything to do with Indiana CDL and all of that. Sure is. Is that only on your property, or can you, if you're hauling your own product, can you go beyond that? You can go beyond that. So, like, say I haul it off my farm to the grain bin, uh, mill, or whatever, I that's still legit. That's still legit. Okay. Or, uh, say I have cows, and I'm going to go to somewhere to pick up feed or something for my animals or for farm use. I can drive that vehicle with no CDL as long as it's utilized for the farm in that capacity. So again, say it's one of those deals. Um, you're you're my neighbor, and you're like, hey, since you're already running 20 miles to town, can you basically backhaul something for me? Um, nope, it's got to be your product, okay. your product. Huh. So, and that's why you see a lot of a lot of big farms. They will go ahead and get their farmhand CDLs. They will go ahead and get a portion plate, DOT numbers, fuel taxes. They'll go ahead and get that stuff and then utilize that as an additional revenue maker, and that's just fine. 
but they got to realize, you know, if you got to be real careful, and if there would be an accident and it comes down that they find out, insurance company lawyers they find out that that is not your product. Oh boy! So I'm not just saying that to be picky or just to be a jerk. You know, I'm also thinking about you know my neighbors. In fact, when I was at the tire store today getting tires on my personal pickup. I was talking with the farmer. He's like, are you going to be mean to us this year? And I'm like, I'm never mean to you guys. Come on. I try to watch out for you. But, sure. but that, that's the big thing is just kind of, you know, make sure it's your own commodity with your own equipment, your own employees. And if you basically fall within that, then you're fine. Yeah, no, I've learned something new today because I didn't realize there was there was a different sort of exemption for farming in indiana so <laughs> cool yeah and Good then stuff. out of it and i'm just quoting indiana because that's what i know sure. here and through other states um there's a lot of federal exemptions on that so other states kind of have similar similar things like that as well but for verbatim that's this that's what indiana looks at and how we how we basically apply the laws to that nice that's really neat. Uh, the other one that I've got on the queue to ask you about is the uh, the inspection week coming up. Are you guys doing that as well? Yes. Um, and basically, I over the last few years that I've been doing social media, mm -hmm. I try to tell everybody, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing to be worried about. Basically, us as inspectors, we're not calling out the reserves and everybody that's got a soap stone and a sweeper's not running around doing that. Basically, all that is is at the end of the week, the state collects the data and submits that to the feds. So we are not out there doing anything, anything more than normal. So in a normal week, say an inspector at a scale house may inspect 40 trucks. Well... Every other week, he's inspecting 40 trucks. So the only thing different is at the end of that, we're just they just collect the specific data on whatever they're looking for. So like um, this last brake check that we participated in, it was how many brakes did you find out of adjustment and how many airlines did you find rubbing, chafing, kinking, interply, and you broke down the numbers on that. So it wasn't like it was anything – extra or above or we weren't out 24 hours a day you know hiding <laughs> it was just normal everyday business and the only thing is at the end of the day we collect the numbers different so on on who did what and who found what so well i'm glad to hear it so really <laughs> yeah i always get every year drivers are, well that's the week i'm going to take off right that's the week i'm going to it's like you know what that's fine because then that means You'll be working those other weeks, and we'll get you then if you're going to have that type of attitude about it. But, but no, in the the 99% of the drivers out there that are doing a good pre-trip or doing a good job, they have nothing to worry about. So, um, but yeah. Good. Now I know each year they do some kind of a different emphasis, um, and I've I've got a article from the CVSA up here right now in front of me that says that the this year's focus is on driver requirements component of roadside inspection. Can you give us a little more information on that? Absolutely. So what that basically means is a full complete level one inspection has like thirty six different steps that we follow. Mm -hmm. Well, about the and, I mean, they've even got a step for – step one, find a safe location for inspection, that, which that's kind of like, oh, that's <laughs> common sense, but it, they've listed it as a step. So um, basically steps like five through whatever is we – first and foremost, we get the driver's license, and we're checking that, one, is it valid? Mm -hmm. Two, does it have the right endorsement or CDL? So are they driving – a straight truck that requires a BCDL, and they've got a B or an A, yep. Or are they driving a semi-tractor that requires a Class A and they have just a B? Or even here in the state of Indiana, we have that 
that gap between 16,001 and 26,000 that's a for higher endorsement. So basically you're utilizing a vehicle for a commercial purpose. State of Indiana states you've got to have a endorsement to operate that vehicle. So we're going to verify that on the driver's license. Next thing we're going to verify is the medical. Um, do you have a valid medical in the system? Has it been submitted um, in the proper channels? And do you have anything specific with that? So like some folks may have on their medical or their license got to be operating with glasses or contacts. Or do they have their hearing aid? Um, do they have spare batteries for said hearing aid? Believe it or not, that is buried in the regulations. Um, <laughs> so you know, if you're utilizing a hearing aid, you have spare batteries. You know, just little things like that that go along to verify that the driver is legitimate and legal to be operating that said vehicle at that time. Great. Well, thanks for that clarification. I was looking at that like, okay, what exactly does this even mean? So I feel a lot more exactly. clear on that. <laughs> exactly. So, so see, it's stuff that are guys are like, well, I got a good medical. My license is valid. And I'm following all that. Well, then there you go. You're good for that week. So good. Um, nothing to really get all worked up about. But uh, Okay. I have but, a... Yeah. I have another question in the chat here from Christina. She asks, uh -huh. does the DOT have quotas for tickets and things? Um, no, we don't. Okay. No, we don't. Uh, the most, the requirements that we have is to maintain our certification. We have to do so many certain inspections per year. or And basically what that means is, like in my case, I am level one certified which means I can inspect everything from front bumper to rear bumper, driver included. So I've got to do a bare minimum of 32 level ones per year to maintain my certification. Um, and then I've got hazmat. I've got non-bulk, bulk hazmat, so like, or cargo tanks. So like i got to do so many cargo tanks. I've got to do so many non-bulk per year to maintain my certification. So um, at a bare minimum, the feds do say you need to do X amount to maintain your certification, but we we don't have any, you know, it's not like if I hit 200 inspections at the end of the month, I get a free toaster oven. It's nothing like, <laughs> it's nothing like that. And, and that's probably my biggest one of those eye roll. I, I love these eye roll mo memes or whatever. If I could do, utilize that on my Facebook page, it'd be full of them. But, you know, the amount of people that are, oh, you're just out here filling a quota, I roll. No, I'm not, you know, believe it or not, I believe in the safety. I believe in getting bad trucks off the road, and that includes some bad drivers if they pop up and need need dealt with as well. Sure. Yeah, and that's um... – yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's you just have a certain number of inspections you have to do, but you're not like required to hand out. You could do all 32 of those inspections without handing out a ticket or a violation, and it would still be Ab legit. <laughs> Ab absolutely. Okay. And, and and that all comes down to officer discretion. Um, a lot of this, when it comes to a ticket versus a warning, a, a 90 percent of it's officer discretion, but there are a few things that I'm sorry, you're getting a ticket. You know, if a driver's suspended, you're getting a ticket. If your driver, you know, and we're real strict on driver's stuff, you know, if your driver's license is expired, which with this COVID and all that stuff, that may, it, that's more of maybe a warning depending on certain circumstances. But, but you know, like suspension, um, issues with your driver's licenses, medical, stuff like that. That's that's really important. Um, same thing with, like, reckless driving, unsafe lane movement, speeding in construction zones. There's some stuff that it's like, I'm, I'm sorry. But, you know, if it comes down to, well, this tire's getting pretty close, um, you know, you're at 230 seconds, that's bare minimum. Um, or if you're below that, it's a violation. It's not out of service, but it's a violation. Um, and then there's certain out of services that are kind of no brainers as well. Um, you know, if, if I stop a, 
a truck and trailer it's got 10 brakes on it and nine out of the 10 are out of adjustment you're getting a ticket i'm sorry that's very dangerous and you know so and and a lot of us will try to maybe you know cite something that's non-moving versus moving less points on your driver's license stuff like that but at the end of the day there's some stuff i'm sorry if you get caught you you know you go to you go to the corner and you get a ticket, but a lot of the stuff, you know, a couple airlines rubbing under, you know, is it a violation? Yes. Does it need necessarily a ticket? No. Um, so, and I'm, you know, the vast majority of trucks have stopped. Drivers are good. Log books are good. Hours of service is good. Vehicle registration, insurance, all that stuff's good. And it's just a little bit of reflective tape is peeling off the trailer that's something hey hey bud just when you get back throw some more on here leave it as a verbal don't worry about it so like sure. i said there's a full spectrum of what we can do officer discretion plays a big part but you know then again some agencies can say on this violation if you find it you write it so um just because i say here's my personal opinion on it doesn't mean that that officer in another state is going to follow that same same guide or rule or whatever so just always keep that in mind and and roadside's never a place to argue about it if you've got questions if you've got you know you're scratching your head and don't understand something the tickets the inspections have plenty of phone numbers on them call and ask you know or depending on how the situation's going ask if you don't understand something say hey can you explain to me, you know, this, this regulation? I, I don't quite understand it. But, you know, having a little bit of common sense roadside goes a long way. Um, and, and driver attitude goes a long way. Um, and I'm not saying that officers all have perfect attitudes. But then again, I try to approach every stop the same. I approach it the same attitude. And if I get a driver that's being a little grumpy that day, I hey, bud, this can go positive or it can go negative you know sure. i'm going to let you reset and you decide so um just kind of have a little common courtesy both sides and nine times out of ten it pays off for the better good so. cool um so the next one we have and thanks for that insight there trooper hoover i think that's really good information to know uh, the next one we have is Steven is in the chat and he asks why the push for non-challengeable warnings versus tickets. Okay, so th what this is, any violation that's written, you can data challenge that violation if you so desire. Um, basically, truck stop rumor was that the reason inspectors were writing warnings versus tickets was because they had heard that if you get a ticket dismissed or if you fight it in court and get it dismissed, then the violation will disappear. That's not entirely true. Now, if a judge or a court dismisses it or plays it off to something else, the feds say that's fine and dandy, but they will lower the class of violation and make it less of an impact but it will not totally disappear because the whole focus of this and these violations and these inspections is the safety aspect of it. So um, just because you may have one city judge in this big town that doesn't understand what a brake chamber is, he may see it and go, I, I have no clue what it is. And I've personally experienced this. You get some city judges, they've already got a stack of laws. And now you're throwing federal laws at them, and they're just like, huh? They'll they'll throw it out and dismiss it. Well, the feds say that's fine and dandy. We'll let you, you know that you, you may not pay the fine or whatever, but you still had a faulty brake chamber. We'll lower the points, but we're not going to make it disappear. So drivers have, and there was a phase where every time we stopped in every violation, the driver, well, I demand you write me a ticket. Mm. No just because they thought they could challenge that ticket and get the ticket written off as something else. And it's like, you know what? And again, it goes back to officer discretion. And it's like, bud, <laughs> nine times out of 10, that ticket, you're not going to get it dismissed. You're not going to, if, 
if me as an officer feels confident to be writing that ticket, that probably means that we have sat down and talked with our courts, with our prosecutors, and they understand the federal laws, and they're not going to be willing to just drop it just because you're standing there saying, I want it dropped. So using that verbiage, that's going to get you in more heartache than anything. And again, um, we're, any any DOT, any any officer, you start trying to boss us around, we're not going to take that as kindly. And and I've had guys, you know, I'll walk up, I'm just going to, you know, say, hey, bud, I noticed this was loose. Just to correct that for me real quick. Well, you, you know, you better write me a ticket for that if you're going to be stopping me for that. And it's like, you know what? I wasn't going to do an inspection, but since you're going this direction, let me see your logbook and all this. Well, you know, and then the logbook's not current. They're licensing, you know, this. And then 20 violations later, an additional, you know, all this heartache overrunning their mouth. So, again, that rumor of, well, you know, a ticket you could fight and get dismissed and get it knocked off your record, that's not entirely true. That's not something that. Um, is going to be, you know, just one of those, oh, well, you, you know, you got it dropped, okay, it'll disappear. The Fed just come in and they said, no, that's not the way we're going to run this program. It's going to be like this. So, so, and again, the reason we're white, writing warnings is um, a lot of times on these roadside stops, these violations, um, you know, if I write a ticket, that's another $150 out of that driver's pocket, the company's pocket. I would much rather he take that 150 bucks, put it back into brakes, zip ties, spare lights, stuff like that, his family, you know. So our way of write a warning is, at, I mean, a warning, no, no fine, nothing like that, no additional points on your license. So, so that's why we write warnings it's not that we're trying to do anything or or screw these drivers over that's just the way that's just the way that it it is yeah that makes a lot of sense um so let me add another one kind of i think related to that let's see second here. Well, phone interview <laughs> <laughs> no worries all right. Yeah, Stephen, I hope that answers your question for you. Thank you. Thanks for submitting that one. Uh, and Trooper Hoover, I think uh, we didn't mention this at the beginning, but for anybody watching who doesn't know, uh, you do have your you have your CL and you've done some driving yourself, right? A absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm a big believer. I like to walk the walk if I'm going to talk the talk. So, you know, I, I went out and and got my CDL, went through the training, went through the process, get my medical every, you know, and I'll, I, I am ashamed to say it, me being a bigger fellow, I got a little bit of blood pressure, so that means I get to go through the medical process once a year instead of getting it two years. So, you know, and that's all stuff that it, it's kind of opened my eyes to see what you guys as drivers go through. So, you know, when I get that guy, well, you don't understand nothing. You've never, I could say, yeah, I've got my CDL. I go go to the doctor and get poked and prodded every year just like you do. You know, I try to do this to better myself and make it, you know, where I can understand it better. So, so you know, and that's just, hopefully that shows these drivers and everybody that's listening just how passionate I am about this and that I'm not trying to be one of those, one of many that's just doing something you know, or just writing a violation that don't understand what, you know, why I'm writing it or the meaning behind that. Sure. So. That's great. Yeah. Um, now, if there were, like, two main things that you could tell every driver to focus on for their inspections, like, what would the top two things you would say be to focus on, um, you know, to avoid... Uh, any trouble or issues or just things that you see really commonly uh, or maybe the most drastic or just what would be your two top things you would recommend that drivers focus on uh, with their trucks to keep themselves as compliant as possible? Well, um, one of the first
first and foremost, and I, I'm going to list three things, so, sure. so I'll add one more to that. But first and foremost is have a good attitude. When, when, when you get stopped roadside, we understand you've got a timeline, we've got a timeline, but having a poor attitude is just going to set the wrong, the wrong setting on that. Next thing, first and foremost, focus on a good pre-trip. Every morning, pick something else to really look into. Um, you know, if really take that morning and look at all your tires, look at your tread depth, get you a, a satchel, have a tire depth gauge, have an air pressure gauge, have, you know, different tools and knickknacks, flashlight, gloves, tire thumper, have that stuff and utilize it. Because more so than not, to me, 90% of these violations that I find roadside, I am walking around the truck. I am not on a creeper. I'm not up on a ladder. I'm not in a pit. I am walking around the truck. And like I told a driver last week, if my big butt can get out of the car, come up, bend over, and see that bad brake chamber, you have no excuse. And and a lot of this stuff that we find, and I'm not denying that things break. I'm not de- denying that in the last two miles you picked up a screw and you got a flat tire. I'm not denying that that stuff doesn't happen, but the stuff I'm finding is is broken, and it has been broken. And that leads me into my favorite thing ever, and I'm sure somebody goes, his favorite is the word. I'm Southern Indiana redneck, so, yep, favorite is a word. So <laughs> my favorite thing is look for dry, powdery rust. Look for dry, powdery rust. Every time you find something that's got dry, powdery rust, 99% of the time there is a problem with it. Something may be loose. Something may be broken, thus rubbing, creating dry, powdery rust. Breaks. I I listed on our uh, Facebook page. Anybody listening, and I'm going to throw this in there. We do have the Indiana State Police commercial vehicle enforcement division i apologize i've not been very active on it over this covid stuff but now that we're getting back into trucks and getting some things lightened up i hope to start returning and getting more tips today but our last the last tip of the day i was able to get out there was dry powder rust all over a tire and a brake truck and i dove in and explained why are we seeing this dry powdery rust? Well, because the brake's not working properly. Well, why is the brake not working properly? The rollers were missing. So in an S-cam type drum brake setting, those rollers are pretty darn important. And if the brake, you know, so I explain step by step what we're looking for. And again, was I under a creeper? Yes, because it led into that. But just walking around, I looked in and I could see there is dry powdery rust where there shouldn't be. Why is that? And I followed the trail. So those are the big things. Have a positive attitude. We've got a job to do. We're just trying to do it. Giving the officer a bunch of crap isn't going to help the situation any. Take the time. Focus on a very, really good pre-trip. Break it down. Each day of the week, focus on somewhere different. You know what? Monday morning. I'm going to do my typical walk around and check the lights, but I'm going to shine my light on all the suspension components. Yep, I don't see any dry powdery rust. There doesn't appear to be anything broken, loose, or missing, yada, yada, yada. And then the next day, you know what? I'm going to really focus on really checking around my fifth wheel, my kingpin, all that good stuff, you know, and and break it down because, um, you know, just taking once a week and just looking, you'd, you'd be surprised. And, in fact, you know, um, just since I, I, again, talked about dry powder rust, I get once or twice a week guys will send me a picture and go, oh, man, I found dry powder rust, and look, I, brown, I found a broken leaf spring, or I found this broken, or I found this bolt loose, or, <laughs> or look, I found this. So it, it shows that, hey, take that time, take a few minutes, focus on that, and that's really going to help these drivers. And realize, and you know what, if you get, and I'm, And I've seen some inspectors, they're grumpy, they're not that, you know, you can tell uh, they don't really want to strike up a conversation, but try it sometime. Um, Just say, hey, you know, what area are you looking? Maybe I can learn some way to improve my safety, you know, my pre-trip 
or if you get a guy that's a little more friendly like I am, I love it when drivers say, hey, uh, you know, what, what exactly are you looking at or what, where are you looking? You know, I'm gonna invite, I personally invite them back. Come on back here. Let me show you this or let me show you that. Look at this. Look at that. And never assume that your brand new 2021 tractor and 2021 trailer is is perfect because it's it's not. And I, I always love that when I get it. I stop a truck and the driver's like, "Why are you stop me? It's a brand new truck." All I hear is <laughs> challenge accepted. Challenge accepted because he's already said it's a brand new truck, aka I haven't looked at crap. Mm. So that means I'm gonna find something wrong. And and. It's like, you know, you can find something wrong on anything. So so don't, you know, don't assume that just because it's brand new. And, again, you send it in for service, look it over good. Did they, did they put the brake drum back on? Did they put the rollers back? You know, don't assume that everything was put back 100%. You need to do your job, and it's up to you to do the inspection, the pre-trip, and verify and document if you find something wrong. So, sure. So I'll kind of get off my soapbox <laughs> there, but no, that's, that's some good information. That's my favorite thing. Favorite thing to preach about is focus on a good pre-trip inspection. Great. So when you were doing the driving, do you did you learn anything in particular that you found useful, you know, to help you both as an inspector and as a driver when you were doing that side of it and like when you were inspected or anything? Um I I don't want to say I'm not not necessarily just because what I was doing is is part of my job was a lot more in depth. Mm-hmm. Um, I did, <laughs> I did accidentally slip out a few federal codes and made my CDL tester kind of look at me funny, because I uh, when I was checking a tire, I said, well, according to three ninety three seventy five, it's got to be this, and he kind of looked at me like, huh? You know, where all he was looking for was it the tread was more than four thirty seconds, but I said, well, according to three ninety three seventy five, which is the tire part code, you know. And because when I went, I did not let it slip who I was. I wore a dirty sweatshirt, dirty pair of, you know, I looked apart. I took a few days off, head and shaved. So I looked like just Joe Bob ready to get a CDL. So, but uh, yeah, a few times I did let it slip some codes and he kind of looked at me funny. But I just said, well, I studied in depth or something. And he's like, oh, okay. But, uh, but no, a lot of it is, um, and then, it, it, and then again, it kind of, kind of gave some examples. So like, you know, you get this guy; he's been driving for 20 years, and then you do something like checking the low air warning light or buzzer. Oh well, I've never checked that. Well, it was it's required to be checked every time on your CDL test. Why, you know, or, or you get that guy, that new driver. Oh, I've never heard of this. It's like it. It's on your CDL test, you know, so don't you, why aren't you doing that? So, so that's something that's another reason. Yeah. I kind of like it is so I can say, well, when I took the CDL test a year ago, <laughs> this was required <laughs> knowledge, so why aren't you doing it each and every day like you said you would be doing when you took the test? So that's, so that's something to think about yeah. on there. Uh, Christina has another question here. She says, what does one need to work in a scale? Well, every state's going to be different. Um, some states, they are civilian scale masters. Others, um, it just depends on what state. So like here in the state of Indiana, are the folks that operate and run the scales are civilian motor carrier inspectors or MCIs. And basically, um, they just go in. If they valid Indiana driver's license, no criminal record, um, and can bat, pass the physical agility part of things, they basically go through the school, and then they get certified when they initially come out to conduct truck inspections, and then they get assigned a certain area, and then they're basically sent to that area and go through additional training at the home facility. And that's how you can become a MCI for the state of Indiana. Me, I'm a trooper 
that's assigned into the commercial motor vehicle division. So I'm basically a trooper with all the truck certification. So when I'm out and about, um, I can stop trucks for speed, for seat belts, for moving violations in the full gamut to where our civilians only stop trucks for bypassing the scales, things of that nature. They don't have the other associated police powers that, that I possess. Gotcha. Cool. That's useful. That's good to know. Uh, and you mentioned you guys are finally getting a little bit more back to normal because of the COVID stuff. Did you, uh, how, how are things going on that front as far as, like, what are you seeing uh, as far as, like, are things opening back up more for you? And have, how normal is it? <laughs> Yeah, the the state the state is is progressed and it's pretty well. Everything's about ninety okay. percent. Um, as far as what we're doing, you know, we're utilizing the mask if we're in close proximity. Um, but a lot of it is like we always, and when we teach new new guys, everybody was like, oh gosh, hand sanitizer and clean your hands. Heck, you get a truck inspector. We were sanitizing and doing everything after each stop anyway. Sure. Um, per officer safety guidelines, we don't like to be within six feet of individuals anyway, just for basic officer safety. So <laughs> that kind of played into it fine. Okay. Um, so we were, so really, um, and I was kind of talking to one of my trainees. I said, you know, I go, if you think about it, cause we're basically like, you know, we're the front line. We're stopping these drivers that this driver could be in New York. And two days later, he could be out in LA and look how much. And I said, yeah, but think about this. What did I teach you after every stop? Sanitize your hands, wipe down your steering wheel, wipe down your computer, you know. And then I said, officer safety, we're not, we don't teach you to get within six feet of anybody for officer safety. So we were already social distancing, <laughs> you know, and we were already doing sanitizing. We were already doing this. We were already limiting our exposure. So it was pretty easy for us to kind of transfer over and, and abide by those things but but yeah the state of indiana we're as far as truck inspections and stuff we're revamping and getting back into it so great well i'm glad to hear it uh it looks like that is it for our questions today and i feel like i've learned a whole lot of new stuff here so i really appreciate your time trooper hoover thanks for coming back on the show hey Oh. Yeah, it, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I did get another if... class last minute question. If you're still up for one more, yeah, <laughs> I oh, think yeah. I've got a little bit of lag on here. Uh, I've got one. How come there are no scales on I-64? Well, basically, from what I understand, I-64. Um, is one of their newest, one of the newer <laughs> and interstate systems to go in. Mm -hmm. So if you, um, like we've got I-69 that's currently being finished up south of Indianapolis. Um, there was talk of adding a facility on I-69, but at the time I-64 was constructed back in the 70s, there was never really enough traffic on that corridor, from what I understand. So there was never really anything put put into place. So, and at the time, it wasn't like I said there wasn't enough traffic. Obviously, things have changed, but the m amount of money and time and effort it takes to put in a scale facility, it, it's not. Not a simple process. So, <laughs> so that, in a nutshell, is why we really don't have anything on I-64 in Indiana. Okay. Cool. Well, like I said, thanks again so much for being on the show. Uh, I like I, I definitely learned a lot. I hope Steve and Christina got their questions answered, and uh, I hope you have a very good day. And if out there, Trooper Hoover. Hey, thank you very much, and. Like I said, anybody that listens to this later on, if you've got a question, uh, feel free to come to the Facebook site, Indiana State Police Commercial Vehicle Enforcement Division. Uh, if you go to the send message, that comes straight to me, my phone, and I, I try to get it answered just as quick as I can. So, And thank you again for having me on. Anytime uh, you want to pop on here, 
uh, let me know on game. Great. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you very much for having me back. Sure. Yeah. Thanks again. We do have a link to your Facebook page in the video's description below. And take care, Sweet. Trooper Hoover. We will uh, see you next time. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Everybody out there, stay safe and free trip on. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We'll see ya. All right. So, there you have it, guys. That was Trooper Hoover. Thanks for requesting that we have him back on the show. If you guys have any other questions for Trooper Hoover, like he said, you can contact him on his Facebook page. I can vouch for the fact that he does typically answer pretty darn quickly on these things. And if you have any questions you'd like to see us feature, perhaps the next time we get Trooper Hoover on the show, uh, feel free to put those in the comments of the video because I do read them, I collect them, and if we get enough of those, I can get Trooper Hoover back on. So thanks again for being here, everybody, for asking all the questions, and I'll see you next Tuesday for our next live stream.